You're listening to The Crunch with Cam Slater. Right here on RCR, Reality Check Radio. This week on Political Tragics, we go to dig deep into the political intrigue and behind-the-scenes fun and games of political pollster and blogster David Farah. You've been involved in politics for about as long as I have. Yeah, I joined the Young Nationals in my first year of university, 1986. And I wasn't really intending to, but there was a, they advertised a meeting with Lockwood Smith. And I just thought, oh, that sounds really interesting. I knew him from his TV personality days, et cetera. Um, So I went along really to hear Lockwood and then found out that it's actually their AGM and somehow ended up being made branch secretary because I actually had a computer, um, et cetera. So it was almost a bit accidental. Well, you're the person who got me into blogging. Um back in the in 2005 when I started you'd already been doing it for a couple of years uh before that but uh we started blogging before it was you know that popular and you know I I had a little goal there 20 David. years and yeah. uh, week I will have been going yeah and I'm close behind you on that and um I said a little goal you probably didn't know it back then but I, there's no point in coming second in my view and I always set a goal to try and beat you and uh, it took me a few years but I got there in the end. Oh you did. It wasn't that well had a goal. <laughs> really <laughs> open about it. Yeah, and um and as I said if someone has to get more numbers than me, I'm uh, glad it was you. Yeah, now didn't you get sacked by the prime minister once? No. <laughs> oh come on, tell the truth. Nope. Wasn't sacked. No, no. Oh, come on. You're going to share something, surely. Well, what what I can share, this is quite a good little story, is um, in 1999 election, I was doing the polling for it, and we were meant to finish polling on the Wednesday night because doing a Thursday night poll is pretty useless because you, Friday it's all over. There's nothing you can do or announce Friday, etc. Mm. So I told the staff we were finishing up on Wednesday, but then got told, no, no, we really want to just, for curiosity's sake, know what the final night's like. So can you organise a shift on Thursday night too? So... I said, okay, we'll do it. So we had the staff party and the polling that night. And it came out that National was around 8% behind Labour, which happens to also be the exact amount that the election result was. But the campaign manager was Jeff Grant. And when he called me up, normally I do a written report, but this time it was yeah. just give us the number. So when Jeff uh, called me up, I thought, oh, I don't want to depress them too much. I'll I'll just say, oh, it was around 6% because, you know, uh, I just thought cushions the blow a wee bit. And Jeff says, oh, thanks. And then I'm with Jeff and then his phone goes and it's Murray McCulley. And Murray's asking Jeff, oh, how's the polling looking? And Jeff goes, oh, yeah, we're around 4 or 5% behind, et cetera. And so he cushioned the blow a bit. And then the next morning at the 5 or 6 a.m. meeting, we're there and the Prime Minister's there. and Which was Jenny Shipley at that time. It was Jenny Shipley. And she goes, Murray, how was the polling last night? And Murray goes, we're only 2% behind. We can win. (laughs) So I'm sitting there thinking, oh, my goodness. And I've told this story to a few people, including, and, and she's no great friend of yours, but I think you'll enjoy this. I mentioned this at some stage to Michelle Bogue uh, just before the 2002 election, and Michelle made me repeat this story to the entire campaign committee uh, so that they would know this is not to happen this time. There is to be no cushioning the blow. And as you probably know, 2002, the blow was so bad it couldn't be cushioned. No, there's no way you can mitigate that disaster. Now, you, I don't know if you want to share this, but you you were the numbers man for Bill English once, weren't you? It's an interesting one there. I wasn't quite the numbers man, but I was very involved with uh, helping with the numbers with his uh, the coup that Don Brash led against him. Mm. And what happened is we had the numbers. And so we went out that night 
and we went to the backbencher to celebrate. Uh, so it was the Brat Pack and me and a couple of others having drinks there, etc. But then, as happens, and we can speculate on who, one person flipped. And so, and I was a staffer in the leader's office at the time, right? But uh, I was also a national activist, but I was a staffer. I worked for the leader. Yeah. And they have the caucus. And to pretty much everyone's surprise, Don Brash walks out first and they've announced he's the leader. And everyone's pretty stunned, et cetera. And this is pretty big. Um, anyway, I kick into professional gear. I work for the leader. Doesn't matter what my opinion was. So I end up spending quite a bit of time with Don that afternoon saying, look, this is what we need to do. I've already changed the website. We need to do a photo shoot. We need to get your business cards. We need to do this, that, et cetera. And I also knew Don. I was like, I like, I thought Bill should have stayed on, but I had huge respect and time for Don um, too. So it wasn't personal. But anyway, so I spent the afternoon with Don. And at the end of it, he goes, oh, you've been so great, David. You've been so good. Look, why don't you come watch the six o'clock news with me and Jalan? I go, yeah. oh, that'd be great. And we're sitting in the office. It was pretty much only the three of us. Maybe there was one or two other people. Yeah. And of course, it's the lead item. But around two minutes into the item, TV One News has, meanwhile, the English camp had premature celebrations last <laughs> night. And there's me with Bill English in the Brat Pack <laughs> drinking in the back beach, obviously celebrating. It's they a us through the window from outside. And you can imagine, like, Jolene's looking at the TV screen, looking at me. <laughs> How is this there? Huge credit to Don Brash. Uh, he kept me on staff. Oh, he was a consummate po um, professional, but of course he was the first person to get nobbled in the National Party by Nicky Hager. You've got some thoughts about how he managed to get all those emails, don't you? Well, my best guess is every email was to or from uh, Don or a guy, Brian, who worked for Don. and. My guess is that someone got into Brian's laptop somehow. This wasn't a inside job, you know, where someone noble was printing out their own emails. Someone deliberately got into a laptop, copied the emails, you could probably do it in, you know, two minutes, et cetera, and, and uh, leak, leak them through. Um, because I can't believe there's a single national MP or staffer who, even if you thought, yo, I'm not a big Don Brash supporter, you wouldn't go give information to Nikki Hager. You know, you give it to the media or something. Yeah, and of course, Nikki Hager used criminal means to, to get at me and you and everybody else as well with dirty politics. Yeah, I had a spy, it seems, put into my office because there were documents taken from my office that turned up in one of his box. And there's no way that a random staffer happened to just think, oh, I'll take these home and, oh, who might I give them to? Oh, Nicky. Yeah, it's obviously he got someone to um, go into my office and take a job there. So, you know, 2005, Nicky Hager had an impact in the election. 2014. Well, he helped get national majority. Well, that's right. 2014, he uh, he again came into the election campaign with dirty politics and National increased its vote. That's the one I mean, sorry, yes. Yeah, yeah. I hear he's planning something for this election. Um, do you think it will have a positive impact on the victims of his book? You know, he never, ever talks to, to the victims of his book. Uh, well, all I'll say is his last book resulted in a commission of inquiry led by a former prime minister and attorney general and a former Supreme Court justice. So you can't get much higher than that. Mm. And their conclusion is the principal allegations in the book are incorrect. So well, that's on the record. Supreme Court judge, former attorney general and PM, looked into everything, heard months of it. His next book, let's just say, I hope you won't need a commission of inquiry to reach the same conclusion. Well, yeah, you and I were subject of the Dirty Politics book. And, you know, having read the book, it, it shows the fevered imagination of a conspiracy theorist in reality. I mean, you know, he was ascribing all sorts of nefarious activities that you and I were supposed to be have been up to uh, for some sort of agenda 
Uh, and I think he just failed to understand that you and I do what we do for sheer entertainment. There's no actually agen- actual agenda. And, you know, remember when uh, Helen Clark's husband, Peter uh, Davis, said, wrote about you saying that you're fermenting happy mischief. And I thought that was a perfect description about what we used to do back then. And it was all just really for laughs and giggles. And they thought it was all serious. And, you know, like there was things about, oh, the prime minister directed Cameron Slater to do this and do that. If they had heard the phone calls that I'd had between me and Jason Eid sometimes when he'd ring me up and say, you know, Cam, uh, you need to take down that post. The, the boss is really upset about that. And I'll just say, well, tell the organ grinder to ring. I don't want to speak to the monkey. And that's the sort of um, way that I treated phone calls from anybody in the National Party back then. And I imagine by that stage, you were the same as well. You were kind of out of the party, not had anything to do with it officially in any sort of capacity other than you were the pollster. And we were just writing what we thought. And it was bizarre. Anyway, it's what happened. And I guess it helped make us more famous than we already were. It did. Now, just a quick, let's have a quick, um, you know, a few bullet, bullet points on some of the key things that you get asked as a as a pollster. Like, I imagine you get questions about what does the margin of error mean? Yeah, look, margin of error, you know, on a poll of 1,000, it's 3% for, for the big parties. And all that means is, look, if it says Labor's on 45%, it means they're actually probably somewhere 95% confident they're between 42 and 48%. So if the polls are really close, like in the New Zealand polls, it's saying actually, you know, it's so close, either party could actually be ahead. If there's a 20% gap, like we're going to talk about in the Northland poll, mm. then doesn't the margin of error can't affect the result, basically. You've got so large gap. So really the margin of error is just saying if it's really close to each other, yeah. you, know, you can't put too much weight on it. What about sample sizes, David? It, does that make a huge difference? Like, is it better to have 10,000 people polled or do you get the same sort of number with 400 or 500 or 1,000? Yeah, look, at 1,000 is a 3% margin of error. If you did, I have to check the exact numbers, but I think if you go up to... 1,500 is still a 2.5% margin of error and it's really not worth doing an extra that. A thousand's the gold standard, basically. Um, yeah. um, there. If you go much under 500, the margin of error is getting over 5% and that's getting you know, a bit too much for those close results. So generally, most polls we between, say, 400 and 1,000 people. Right, so if you say polling of four hundred people and you've got a a, a clear result of twenty percent difference, the margin of error you've just said is largely irrelevant. There's almost no point in polling an extra four hundred people because you're going to end up with the same sort of numbers. Is that what yeah? The saying? only reason you might poll more is if you want to place a lot of reliance on the breakdowns by gender and age, because yeah. a four hundred poll, then you've got two hundred women, two hundred men. That's getting like a seven percent margin of error. So if you're a political party, you'll probably do bigger samples because they do need to know how we're dealing with men, women, under 40s. But if it's a media poll, actually um, that top line figure is still quite robust. The polls uh, seem to show that at the moment, well, and it might be slightly different with all of this, you know, Kerry Allen stuff impacting the government. But let's just put that to one side. The latest polls show that it's almost harder to pick than a broken nose. Would you would you agree with that at the moment? When I speak to uh, groups around New Zealand, I say, look, the short answer is it's very close. The long answer is it's very, very, very close. Right. Uh, no poll for the last 18 months has had either block get more than 62 or 63 seats out of 120. You need 61 to 1. Yeah. Um, and that's partly because, you know, you've got two centre-right parties. You've got New Zealand first if they make it, and you've got three centre-left parties. And, you know, the two blocks are very balanced. As a professional pollster for this election, do you believe that uh, – let's just talk about the minor parties. National's going to get there. 
Labor's going to get there. The Greens are going to get there. ACT is going to get there. To party Maori, let's not talk about them because they've got, you know, kind of a, a bent system that helps them get there. For the minor parties, including New Zealand First, what are you seeing as seeing now as a gut feel on who is likely to get there and who's likely to not get there? New Zealand First is the most likely might party outside Parliament to make it. I wouldn't go as far as to say the odds are 50-50, but they're definitely better than last time uh, because I think the issues they're campaigning on, uh, especially around co-governance, are striking much more resonance. They have some competition there. Um, my general rule of thumb is, look, if Winston goes into the election with a public poll showing him at 4% or above, he'll make 5 because we know he campaigns well. Yep. If he's below 4%, the challenge for them is going to be that sort of relevance, wasted vote, et cetera. So I think the public polls over the next two months will be quite important, but he's definitely got the best and you could almost say the only chance of, of making it from the parties that are not there at the moment. What are the headline numbers there, uh, David, and what is it showing, especially for Democracy New Zealand? What do these numbers show? And this is it. Remember, this is exclusive. This is the first time that anyone's polled in Northland, and we've got a stake in the ground here uh, so that we can, you know, hold the feet to the fire of all the candidates. Yeah, well, on the candidate line, we can talk about the party vote also, of course, but you've got Grant McCallum, the national candidate's at 38%. Mm-hmm. Then you've got Willow Jean Prime, the incumbent MP, a pretty disastrous result. She's only 18%. So she'll be hoping for a high list ranking then, won't she? Yeah, and she'll need a very high list ranking because at the moment, Labor's only going to get around five list MPs and she was number 10 on their effective list, i.e. when you take account of who wins electorates there. Uh, so it's not looking good for her. You've got Shane Jones uh, next on 6%. And then the ACT candidate, who's a list MP, Mark Cameron, in fourth place on 3%. And Matt King, the former national MP and leader and candidate for democracy, NZ on 2%. Now, there are 30% undecided. And we talked about Marge Vera. Yeah. So what that says is you can't totally rule out, you know, that, that 20% between national and Labour could maybe get closed if like national candidate has a bad campaign and the other ones, the yeah, you know, there's three other centre-right candidates, Act New Zealand First, Democracy New Zealand. If they all had really good campaigns and got up to five, ten percent each and Labour gained a through, possibly it's plausible that you know there. But outside those two, if you're polling three months out at three or six percent or two percent, it's very, very hard to see that there's any pathway to, to you winning uh, there. You know, you'd have to win two-thirds of the undecided voters, and minor parties have never done that. So very much my reading is this is national seat to lose, and that's no big surprise. It has, with the exception of when Winston won a Hanabar election, has been, a, and last election where Labour won it, has been a pretty solid national seat for a long time. So what we're really seeing is a sort of return to normalcy. If you yeah. look at the party, that shows how much things have swung against the government, because You've got National at 36% and ACT at 16 Add those two get together, 52%. Add Labour and Greens together, 23%. And you've got 16% undecided. So on the party vote, it's very clearly going back to the centre-right. And when you ask people, as we do, this is one of the most powerful questions, I think, do you think your country's in the right or the wrong direction? is I'm just bringing up the exact numbers there, but they're pretty terrible. Yeah, it's pretty bad. 19% of Northland residents in this poll say we're heading the right direction, 71% the wrong direction. Yeah, so again, you're the Labour candidate, very, very hard to win against that. And people have sort of worked out, I think, in that seat, yo. They're actually quite smart. Act's got 16% party vote, but only a few percent electorate vote. So they know if you want to change the government, you know, 
you have party vote for any of the centre-right parties. But if you want to win the seat, you get behind the, the centre-right candidate who's most likely to win. And, yeah. and that's clearly Grant McKellen. So just to clarify, you, you asked people uh, which candidate from which party you would give your candidate vote. You didn't ask about names. You just said, who who would you vote for the national candidate? And then they said, oh, I'll vote for the national candidate. Or yeah, we said, say which candidate or party's candidate. So they might just say the national candidate, or if they know the name, they might say Grant McKellen. They might right. say New Zealand first candidate. That We don't give them a, a list. We just say which party's candidate or candidate will you vote for. What we did do, though, is after we asked that question, mm. because we don't give them names, we then just ask, can, can you, you name, name the candidates for those five parties? That was and, interesting. Those numbers are fascinating. Yeah, because the Labour candidate, who's the current MP, 39% knew she's the current MP. That's mm. actually low. Electric MPs generally should be at 70% name awareness. Seven out of 10 people should be able to say who the local MP is. There, it's only four out of 10 for Willow Jean. Mm. The national candidate's not got a great name recognition at 29%. Admittedly, he's been selected a bit later, but you know, he should be aiming for 70% also. So he has to really double his name recognition there. Yeah. The at list MPs only at seven percent name recognition, which surprised me because normally list MPs do have a local profile. Mm. Shane Jones, actually, of the candidates not in Parliament, it's is an impressive number best. for him, really. Yeah, thirty four percent could name him as the New Zealand first candidate, etc. So he's certainly known there, um, but. Mostly, though, people are still not saying they're going to vote for him just because they know he's he's the candidate. Now, Matt King, you know, he, former MP, former MP, bet bet Winston in 2017 um, there, but having defected to and set up Democracy New Zealand, even though you know he's very active with his meetings, only one in five or nineteen percent knew that he was the candidate. And we actually tried to help them a bit because we actually said, "Can you name the leader and local candidate for Democracy New Zealand?" Right. Yeah. Um, there. So yeah, he's he's half of Shane Jones. As yeah, I f- I found those numbers fascinating, and I was um, talking to uh, Morris Williamson offline earlier, and um, he said to me when he first got selected in Pankar- Pakaranga for the election there, that uh, that he spent six months going to basically the opening of every envelope um, and. Uh, public meetings and getting in the local paper and and the entire team worked, you know, 24 seven to get the name awareness out. And he had this big meeting with the committee and said, we we've done an amazing job. This is going to, we're going to do some polling on rate name recognition. I expect our name recognition to be massively up there. And when he got the results a week later, he had 17% name recognition. He said it sort of popped his balloon a bit that all of that work was almost for nothing. Look, it, it is hard, hard work. Some candidates, yo, know, are at 10, 12 percent name recognition. And the challenge is they're now in the last 90 days, which means they've got a spending cap. Yeah. I always think you should select candidates the year before the election. And from January through to three months before, you should be spending 50 to 75,000 at least on name recognition, public meeting billboards, mail drops, door knocking, uh, turning up to all the meetings, et cetera. Uh, for it really does make a big difference. So your call on Northland, uh, based on this poll, is that it's pretty much a lock for the National Party and the national candidate? both in the Unless list. they did something really bad, yes. Well, Grant McCullum's not known for that. No. I know Grant. He's he's pretty solid. I've known Grant for nearly thirty years. You know, he's a board former board member of the National Party, and and you know, he's just a solid farmer. He's never going to set the world also on fire. Has a very big membership base in the electorate. Um, mm. I understand the former MP John Carter is in charge of membership and um, 
in the past, I don't know how many they have at the moment, but you know, he's so has had them up to nearly 2,000 members at times, and they might be one dollar members or five dollar members, but Doesn't still members are on your mailing list, and yep. they'll probably be putting hoardings up. Yeah, it's, the, Northland's always had one of the biggest memberships in the National Party, you know, from the time that I can remember. Um, you know, my father talking about membership in Northland was always rated as as a, a high. Yeah, you know, they're from the old school of get as many members as possible club, rather than the Murray McCulley club, which is to have as few members as possible because they're yes. pissed. Okay, they try to roll you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right, so you're the ultimate political tragic, really, David. You're the one who got me started into blogging, and uh, you know, People we had some me for that. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I don't know if you know this, but um, in 2008, remember we did the blogmobile trip all around the, the country and we had spent two or three hours with Jacinda Ardern having lunch um, in, in uh, Morrinsville. Remember that? Yeah. And uh, I understand that when Dirty Politics came out that um, David Cunliffe, who was the leader at the time, called all the caucus together and said, right, now who's met these characters, David Farrer and Cameron Slater? and Apparently, Jacinda Ardern, to her credit, actually put her hand up and admitted to the fact that she had had, had a lunch with us back then. Um, so yeah, I thought that was funny. I was told that by several uh, Labour Party caucus members, yeah. and I challenged them and said, well, you've had something to do with me. Did you put your hand up? And they said, oh, hell no. <laughs> Thank you for coming on The Crunch with me today, David, and sharing the numbers about the Northland Poll and uh, I look forward to touching base on some other polling questions closer to the election. Looking forward to it also. Fantastic. Thank you. As you can see, David had some good insights there into the challenges for both Matt King and Shane Jones in Northland. The margin of error is irrelevant here as the gap is too large for that to take into account. And it would be a miracle, really, on these numbers to defeat the current national candidate, Grant McCullum. This is The Crunch with Cam Slater. Conversations with a side of controversy, right here on RCR.